One of the things that I've kind of noticed um, just about about us as human beings, you know, kind of people, is um, a lot of times we want to just we want to be somewhere. Here's what I mean by that: the number of people who just like I want to go to the ocean and just look at it is just kind of striking to me. It's like, uh, or people like want to go to the Grand Canyon. I just want to see it. They take it all in. Um, I was thinking about this because a couple a couple weeks ago, before the semester ended, um, we had a we had a party from some, with some of our alumni, and uh, a couple of them got Taylor Swift tickets. And that was I don't know if you know this, but there was this like massive thing about like. People all day. In fact, they did this. They they had their computers going all day in order to get these tickets. They had like a team of three. Both of them did. Um, so six people trying to get these these tickets, and they did it. It was like this massive thing because they just wanted. The idea was, I just want to be there. Because I was asking them, like, yeah, you know, you know all of her songs already. Uh, you could just press play. You just listen online. You could just why? I, it wasn't like making fun. It was just kind of like, what's the the thing? And they said, I just want to be there. Which makes sense, you know. You go, go to the ocean. I just want to be there. I go to see the Grand Canyon, to see mountains. I just want to be in the mountains. I just want to be at a concert or be at the game. Which makes sense because as human beings, that's what we are, right? We're human beings, and so it makes sense that there's sometimes when just the valuable thing is that we're there, right? The valuable thing is that here I am. I'm just being here. At the same time. I struggle with that because、um, if I go to the ocean, I think I want to get in that. Like I want to do something. If I Grand Canyon, literally, I went to Grand Canyon one time. I remember thinking, do I have enough time to do the rim to rim? Because you know you can hike down one, one rim to the other rim and then rim to rim and back again. Like I just, I don't want to just. It was impress, impressive. I'll say that Grand Canyon, amazing. But I want to do something there. Same thing in, when it comes to the mountains. I love the mountains; they're just gorgeous. But every time I see a mountain peak, I think, "Can I get up there? I want. I want to do something." And, and so again, I know that I'll say this too. At every concert I've ever been to, I always think, "Like, what if like one of their singers drops out? Like, they'll need some help, and I'll I'll be the person to help them." It could because it's one thing. I also have a highly inflated sense of self.、Um, you know what I'm talking about.、Uh, <laughs> but but there's that、um, that sense of like, I don't just want to be here. I want to do something. Okay. Both are good. We need to understand this because the error falls in when we emphasize one to the exclusion of the other. There are people who are overworked, right? There are people who just like it's all about doing, 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 and have, they have to be reminded that we're not human do- human doings. We're human beings. Yes, hundred percent. At the same time, while we are human beings, we're made to do. Like we're, we're literally the way that God made us is to do. To do a lot of things, where he made us to create, he made us to build, he made us to fix things, he made us to work, he made us for so many things. The biggest thing God ever made us for is at the heart of our identity. It's the, actually the heart of His identity. The biggest thing God ever made us to do is to love. I can be in love, hundred percent, gift. But to choose to love, that also is a gift. And so, so while we have our beings. We're called to do many things, and the primary thing we're called to do is we're called to love. And so we've said this many, many times. The church has defined love as love is willing the good of the other. And so, whether I love a stranger, or whether I love my mom, or if spouses love each other, it's not just romantic feelings, not just feelings of affection. It's choosing to do something. It's choosing to will that good, the good of that person. So that's that's massive. That's how we love. When it comes to God. We're made to love God above everything, above every one. We're made to love God. But here is the question: If love is willing the good of the other, how do we love God? Because God is goodness itself. God doesn't need us at all. I don't need to. If I will God's good, what what it? I can't add to His goodness. So what is it to love God? Well, we can love God in three ways. One is Saint John talks about this. Not today, but he talks about other places in the Bible. He says、um, we can know we love God if we take care of our brother and sister. If we love the people around us, if we love the people that need our love, they need our attention, they need our help. When we love them, we're loving God. That's one. We love God by loving the people we see, our brother that we see, our sister that we see. The second way we love God is we love God by obeying Him. Jesus said this: You can't claim to love God. And not obey his commandments. The way we, the way we love God is through obedience to his commandments. And so, if I'm ever questioning, like, do I love, really love God enough? What I have to do is I don't just look at how I'm feeling. I have to look at how I'm acting. Am I choosing to obey him? So I, 
can love God by willing the good of the people around me who need love. I can love God by obeying him. But the third way we love God, it's, a, it's an extension, ex- expansion, extension of obeying him. We love God when we worship God. We love God when we worship God as he has asked us to worship him. And this is the key thing. We love God when we obey him by worshiping him as he's asked us to worship him. Because we have to understand, you probably know this already. I've said this many times, I'll say it again today on the Feast of the Epiphany. The heart of religion is not our creed, although our creed is really important. And the heart of religion is not the moral life, although the moral life is very important. The heart of religion, every religion around the world, the heart of religion is worship. The heart of religion is worship, is that sense of what do we give to God? And that's why the key thing is this, the heart of worship is not feelings. The heart of worship is not simply uh, doing anything. The heart of worship is going to be sacrifice. It's always going to be sacrifice. This is the heart of worship, which is the heart of religion, which is the heart of what it is to love God. Sacrifice. Why am I bringing this up on a day like today? Well, I'm bringing it up on a day like today because the Feast of the Epiphany, what do you have? You have the first people who ever worshipped Jesus Christ incarnate on this, on this earth. You have the, the Magi, right? They journey from afar and they bring Jesus gifts. And they offer those gifts. That's a sacrifice. And those gifts all mean something. I, of course, you know, we have gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so theologians have said many, many times that the gold is a symbol of Jesus being worshipped as, as king. Uh, that the frankincense is a symbol of Jesus being worshipped as priest who offers incense. The myrrh is a sign of Jesus' inevitable death. And he's being anointing at death. Anointed at death. That he's ultimately going to be not just the priest who offers the sacrifice, he's going to be the victim who's being offered in the sacrifice. These three magi, these three gifts that come before the Lord God incarnate, they worship him, they bow down, they prostrate themselves before him, and they offer a sacrifice. And this is, this is absolutely going to be so essentially critical for every one of us because the heart of religion is worship and the heart of worship is sacrifice. You know, um, a little while ago, I had an interview with a, a, a newspaper and the, the author of the newspaper is a Catholic and great, great guy, uh, as far as I know. <laughs> and uh, he asked the question, he said, have you noticed that because of COVID, fewer people are returning to in-person mass? And I talked about how it's super important that everyone uh, gets back to mass if they can be at, at, at mass at all, then they need to be at mass, obviously. And he said, yeah, I know that because, he says, because the point is you need to receive the Eucharist. You can't just watch mass online because the point is to receive the Eucharist. And I had to stop and say, actually, no, that's not true. One of the points, one of the gifts of the Mass is we get to receive the Eucharist. Yes, 100%. I mean, Jesus made it very, very clear that unless we eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, we don't have life. So, yes, very, very important to be able to receive the Eucharist. Absolutely. I'm not going to deny that. But the point of the Mass is not to receive Holy Communion. The point of Mass is to offer the sacrifice of the Son of God, to the Father. The point of the Mass is to have this, this sacrifice, but the sacrifice of the Last Supper and the sacrifice of Calvary, which are brought into one here at every Mass, is to offer that sacrifice to the Father. The whole point is to love God, which means the whole point of our lives is to go to Mass. The point of our lives is to worship God by offering the greatest sacrifice any of us could ever possibly hope or even imagine we could be part of. That's why this piece of the Epiphany is all about worship. It is all about sacrifice. It's all about what we do every single Sunday and every single day in so many Catholic churches. We recognize, we recognize this. We recognize that I'm not loving God if I know that he has asked me, commanded me in fact, to do this in memory of him to offer the sacrifice in memory of him, to offer himself, united with the ministerial priest, to the Father, and I stay away. We're made to love. The biggest thing, the best thing, the primary thing we're called to do, made to do, is to love. The one we're called to love beyond anyone else is God himself and the way he has asked us to love him. Yes, serving our brothers and sisters. Yes, obeying his commandments. But this particular commandment, of do this in memory of me is the critical thing that makes all of the difference in the world. Makes all the difference in the world. But the question is, does it make the difference in my life? Here's what I mean. 
I think a lot of times we show up to Mass and we leave unchanged. We show up to Mass and we leave the same as we walked into Mass. It's, it's, this is supposed to make all the difference in the world, but it doesn't even make a difference in my life. Because again, and again, it might not be my fault, it might not be your fault, but it might be that we just didn't expect that anything would happen and wouldn't, didn't expect that anything should change. I went to Mass, checked the box, now I'm leaving. But how could we possibly come into contact to encounter the true and living God and not be somewhat changed? In fact, the Magi, what does it say? It says, they offered their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they were warned in a dream. So they departed for their home by another way. And I gotta tell you, saints and people in the church for years have read that, for 2,000 years, have read that and said, yes, that's what's supposed to happen. I came to the Lord one way, but when I worshiped him, it changed me and I had to go home a different way. I couldn't go home the same way. I couldn't return the same person I was when I walked into the Lord's presence. So why do we? Like, why is it the case that so often we come to Mass and we leave unchanged? When the whole point of it is I've loved the Lord in such a way that I'm not the same anymore. I think part of it is because we're missing two things. A, we're missing out on the reality that we're here to sacrifice. We're here to unite our prayers as kingdom priests, right, with the prayers of the ministerial priest at the altar, who he is united to the great high priest, Jesus. We forget, we re, or we never knew, that what we're supposed to be doing here is worshiping. We're supposed to be offering the sacrifice. We're supposed to be uniting our hearts. When the priest is praying those words, it's not like, okay, get done, get done. Okay, amen, that was my part. No, your part, our part together is to be saying, okay, Lord, Father in heaven, receive this sacrifice. May you be glorified. May this world be sanctified. May this world be changed and transformed. But if we just show up and we sit and watch, of course we're unchanged. That's why, you know, go look at the Grand Canyon. It's neat. You hike the Grand Canyon, you're different. You go and look at the ocean, it's cool. You get in the ocean and swim around. Okay, you're going to be different. Go to the concert. Awesome. Take it in. You called up on stage, your life is different from then on out. And same thing is supposed to be true when it comes to the Mass. We're not here to watch. We're not here to just be here. We're here to do something. We're here to offer up the sacrifice of the Son to the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. We're also called to do the other thing. And this is the last thing. Remember the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh. Gold for a king. Frankincense for a priest. And myrrh for the one who died. Jesus is not just the priest who offers the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice that's offered. And so are you. At every Mass, so are you. In fact, we even pray it in the Eucharistic prayer. Say, Lord, make of us an eternal offering to you. Make of us an eternal oblation to you. Let us be, our lives, be a gift. If I go to Mass and I return unchanged, it's probably because I didn't offer anything. Let's say that again. If I go to Mass and I leave the same way I walked in, it's because I didn't offer anything. I didn't give him anything. What do you mean, what do you mean give him? I didn't give him what I was afraid of. I didn't give him what I love. I didn't give God access to my hopes. I didn't give God access to my weaknesses. I didn't give God anything. I just showed up and watched. But you are not baptized to show up and watch. Jesus Christ did not come to this earth so you could show up and watch. He didn't give us the gift of the Eucharist so you could show up and watch. He didn't die and rise from the dead and send his Holy Spirit into your life and my life so we could show up to Mass and watch. He did those things so that we could be part of the sacrifice, so we could unite our lives and our sacrifices to his life and to his sacrifice. He did this so that every time we approached him, we would be changed. So that every time we walked into the church and offered the sacrifice with the priest, with Jesus himself, we would be different. We would be more like him. And we could never return to our home in the same way. We go back home, but every time we go back home, by a different way.